of here on Keystroke Medium. I am Josh Hayes here with my co-host Scott Moon, and tonight we are joined by the best-selling author of the Full Metal Verse series, Jeff Haskell. He uh, reached out and wanted to talk about superheroes, and I really like superheroes, so we're going to talk about it tonight. And uh, this tonight's episode is brought to you by Immortals, an epic fantasy adventure by Joshua Smith. It's out tomorrow by Athon Press, only for two ninety nine, and we're going to talk about that a little later. Uh, right now, we're going to jump right into the show. Welcome everyone that's in the live feed, and my goodness, the live feed chat has been going off since basically when i posted the link and so 703 is what i have for the first comment bill frisbee wins tonight congratulations bill you win the prize the golden star of first posting which uh maybe we should make like a a board and we'll have like we'll add the names of the people like employee of the month to the board and see how that goes i'll probably lose it like everything else jeff welcome to the show man Hey guys, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's an awesome show to be on. I watch it. I watched a couple episodes, and you guys are fantastic. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we met in Vegas last year. Um, uh, Vegas. Um, yeah. Woo! It did not stay there. Um, and you have uh, a really, really uh, long-running superhero series. Um, we've we've talked with a couple of superhero authors on the show. Uh, CC KK has been on a couple times. We've Charles had, is the uh, man. Uh, Justin Sloan also on the show. Um, both of those guys write some pretty good uh, superhero fiction. And and tonight we want to break it down just a little bit with you. Uh, but before we get into that conversation, let's talk a little bit about what we've been up to uh, this week. Uh, Scott has uh, had um, a really slow week with his uh, writing, <laughs> some bumps and grinds at work. And uh, yeah. um, I don't know if you, how much you want to share, but uh, Scott, I'll do you want to go first? It. I'll talk about it. I, I was writing really good. I, um, I had a, a kind of a hot call at work and I had to run a little bit and I got there and uh, basically it was a um, domestic violence weapon call where somebody was supposedly pointing a gun at a pregnant woman. We hear screaming. We run down the parking lot. We get to the door. And of course, she shuts the door and doesn't want to come out and talk to us, which is actually pretty common. But we know there's two people in there and we need to go in. And I'm about ready to boot the door. And I get so dizzy, I about fall on my face, which has never happened to me in 23 years. So um, we go through. I, I get another supervisor out there. And the other supervisor that day happens to be a SWAT officer. So I feel it's in good hands. And I transition over to him and I go to the ambulance and they check, I think they're going to check my blood sugar and I wind up in the emergency room for four hours. And, um, so that, that took a bite out of my writing yesterday. Not what I expected <laughs> no, to do a little bit at all. It's kind of weird. Um, and then I'll go, I guess I'm going to go see a cardiologist tomorrow and, um, they'll, uh, they'll take a look at what's going on there. I've I never, I haven't posted anything on Facebook or any social media. It's just been, my close friends. So this is kind of a big reveal, big reveal, but of the bad kind. Yeah. But you know, I mean, the thing is, is it's, it's like, it was like a case of severe dizziness. I, I couldn't push away for lack of a better term. And for me, that's pretty un unusual. And so it was just weird. And, you know, dizziness could be a thousand different things. Maybe I just drink too much coffee. Who knows? You know, but I don't know if you could actually drink too much coffee. It's probably not possible really. I mean, I got the shakes the other day. I drank so much coffee. I started the day like at 6 a.m. with coffee. And then at like 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., I was drinking more coffee. And so I basically woke up with coffee and then went to sleep coffee. And I was like, Ugh. right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like when I've been in the same place where you can drink coffee and go to bed and you yeah. sleep. Yeah. Sort of like drink a whole cot. And then you go and you have like you can feel the colors and you like it's it's like you're on some kind of psychedelic, like when you're laying in bed dreaming and sleeping, but you're also awake and you can't close your eyes yeah and you're very tense so. <laughs> yeah. you know one of my favorite yeah. uh, mad tv skits from back in the 90s was uh this guy that went into the hospital for a checkup and i can't remember his name it was something like the coffee guy um but basically he drank so much coffee that he couldn't blink and so he like he'd go into the <laughs> checkup and he was like he was like that checks out. yeah and the, the doctor was like all right go ahead and blink and he'd like He'd like shake his head like this and he like peed coffee. His like pee sample was actual coffee that was like Java Man. There you go. Oh. I think Corvo like, came through in a pinch. Thanks, Corvo. Yeah. Probably probably a, a real thing. We're probably headed that way. Yeah. Going. 
Uh, what about you, Jeffrey? Uh, anything interesting uh, happened with you this week? Well, boy, I didn't kick down any doors, though that would have been fun. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't drink coffee, but I had a couple of monsters to say, so, you know, oh. that's about the same thing. It's about the same thing. Um, actually, my family and I just went on vacation, so it was really cool. We went down to um, Salt Lake City, and we live in Idaho, and um, saw the went to BYU, and they have a paleontology museum there. And got to stand in front of a, a, a life-sized velociraptor, Utah raptor, which is a scary beast. Uh, and also a giant sloth, which is also a scary beast. I mean, the raptor's claws, not his hand, but it's like claws were as long as my hand. And it was like 12 feet tall, 14 feet long. And then the sloth was like an ele- size of an elephant. But with claws, I mean, it could it could like step on you by accident and kill you, and you wouldn't even know it because it's just going so slow. What kind of trees does sloth that size hang around in? That's <laughs> well, <laughs> back in the um, Cretaceous period, where it grew, where it, where it was alive, the trees were huge, right? But they were all giant ferns, so it was mm-hmm. like you know they had plenty of large trees, much more oxygen in the atmosphere back then, so everything grew bigger. But it was really cool, is because up there, and I'm like, oh, you know, I need to write a book with dinosaurs in it. That's just you know, Michael Scott Earl wrote Tamer, which is just he, the idea of writing a book about arc was just so brilliant on his part. And ever since that, I've wanted to write a book about dinosaurs, but I never really had an idea. And then while I was in this museum surrounded by dinosaurs, I was like, Oh, I've got my idea now. So that's my, that's my plan for next year. Nice. Always good to have a plan. There's a, uh, a fantasy author. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he wrote a, uh, a novel with with dinosaurs in it. I've never read it. Um, I've just seen the cover, and it, the cover looks really good. And 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 George Martin gave it a tag, um, but the cover is really cool. It's like the guys riding some kind of a. Uh, it's not a velociraptor, but it, it looks like some kind of a, a a a raptor dinosaur type thing, and that'd be pretty cool. Epic fantasy with dinosaurs. I can dig that. It wouldn't be the internet if someone didn't correct me. Ha ha, Rick. Uh, but Rick corrected me in the comments, so. You know, oh, I'm not a, oh, I'm not a dinosaur study. Let's see, let's see, let's see. And it lived in the Crete long after the Cretaceous period, if I'm not mistaken. It was the Ple- I don't even know how to say that. Pleliocene? Pleleo Pleocene. Pleocene. That doesn't matter anyway. I Pleocene. love you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Uh let's see. What have I been up to this week? Well, I've been writing a crap ton. Uh, Echoes of Valor is almost done. Uh, I hope to have it to Steve by tomorrow. And uh, gosh, I'm ready for that book to be done. <laughs> Welcome to pre-orders. Uh, I don't even know where we're at on pre-orders. I know the last time we had, uh, the last time Steve and I talked, we had a crap ton. Um right. I want to see where the ranking is right now. I was just going to say, yeah, because, I mean, you've heard me complain about writing for pre-orders before in the past, but that was back when I did my own pre-orders. And yeah. It's almost always an extremely stressful environment. Oh, it's stressing me out. I have a pre-order up right now, but it's not as bad because I am was almost done by the time they put it on pre-order. So it makes it a little bit easier. I'm really excited for the year-long pre-orders. I'm going to take advantage of that. No more 30-day pre-orders writing until my fingers bleed to get get it done in time is, is that already out is it available now yeah it's they're beta testing it i th- i think it's beta testing in the sense that virtually everybody can use it but everybody well, i know has it i'm going to put up a pre-order for one year from now every month for the like 12 pre-orders <laughs> oh no a year oh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, that doesn't sound like you, you, got, you got pre-order set up 12 of them in a row you got a year yeah, yeah. well i mean that should be easy no problem Okay. I, don't, I don't know if I want to do any of this. I mean, this pre-order is really stressing me out. I've been up to like midnight, two o'clock in the morning every night, working on this book, trying to get it done. Drinking coffee. Fortunately, Steve morning hasn't needed it so far yet. So yeah, I drink more coffee. Drinking coffee in your sleep. I got to get enough coffee in my system. So when I wake up, it'll already be there and ready for me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Lauren, it's the year of doom. <laughs> That's right. The doom year. I kind of predict that there's going to be a, a flood of one-year pre-orders, and then everybody's going to cool off. And then in a year, people are going to be like, I forgot I had a pre-order. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, exactly. the year of pre-order is good. Like, so I'm not a huge fan of of um, rapid releasing, even though I know what the uh, the science is behind it and the, the, the purpose behind it. But I'd rather relax and just write a book like, have like three or four come out a year. And so that extended pre-order would be cool to have that at you know, that amount of time where, cause like sometimes 
Amazon screws up when you, you publish the first book, let's say in a four book series, and it only shows the one book, but it, it's it you know that it's going to be a series, and then the other the people are buying it, going this this book ended on a cliffhanger. This is not good. Blah, 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 blah. Like it's the beginning of a series, and I'm nuts. Like there's going to be more books after this, right? Um, That's what we call no series. offense to any readers watching this. Yeah, no, lots of offense, lots of offense. <laughs> yeah. You don't like the word numb nuts. Numb nuts. Uh, I'm mean more of the readers part, but I do, cliff I, I do cliffhangers, and uh, my favorite review is on book six, and the guy says, uh, "Enough with the cliffhangers already." Great book, five stars. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when's the next book? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I get a lot of. When's the next book? Uh, you know, I don't. I, there are sometimes I really hate cliffhangers, but then there are sometimes when I'm like, "Oh, this would be fun to put a cliffhanger." Well, and in. you can do anything if you do it well. Right? If you that's want to talk. Snake cliffhangers in your little craft section i'd love to because there's good cliffhangers and then there's bad cliffhangers yeah, yeah. and the thing that everybody complains about is the bad ones the good oh. ones they love they don't hardly even notice them we won't we won't talk about uh going over the waterfall in pandora star tonight um let's let's talk a little bit about you um this is your first time on the show so let's uh let's dig into jeff haskell a little bit why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in writing well, it's actually a really cool story. I mean, I like it. I like telling you it. You like cool stories. Um, I always wanted to be a writer. I'm one of those people, right? Like, I always wanted to be a writer. I've been writing my whole life, but I haven't been writing my whole life. I wanted to be a writer up until I was about 20. And I had so many people tell me that I would never be a writer that I just sort of lost the dream and just sort of doodled and wrote short stories and stuff on my own. Um, on my own time, not really thinking that I'd ever be a writer because – you know, so many people tell you you're not. Actually, I had a teacher tell me once that I was an insult to the written word. So, <laughs> yay, teachers. Yeah. Wow. Um, let's, let's, let's get that teacher on the show, right? Yeah. Now. yeah right. All this um, uplifting education. Here's my USA Today best selling author status. Ha ha. Ding. But uh, I didn't actually do it because of revenge. What happened was is I was in the Army, and when I got out of the Army, I did tech support because I had used computers, you know, during the 80s and 90s. And so in 98, when I was looking for a job, I was like, oh, hey, who's Earthlink? I never heard of them. I'll go work for them. And so after that, I just worked at a bunch of different companies like Microsoft and a university or two. And in 2009, I got really sick and I didn't know what was wrong with me and nobody could tell me what was wrong with me. But the, the one thing I couldn't do was talk. And I did phone tech support out of call centers. And uh, <laughs> one month turned into, yeah, right? One month turned into three, and three months turned into six, and I couldn't go back to work. Eventually, they fired me, and I, my wife and I had to figure out something to do, and so I went back to school. And while I was at school, I was avoiding doing my schoolwork, and I read this great book called Wearing the Cape by Marion G. Harmon. And if you like superhero fiction like I do, like the comic book kind of superhero fiction where the good guys wear costumes and the bad guys have you know great names like Dr. Villain, then... <laughs> Dr. Josh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, of doom. Then you'll love wearing the cape because it's that classic kind of superhero thing. And up until that point, I didn't know superhero fiction existed. Only thing I'd ever seen was the Marvel and DC stuff. And, and having being a lifelong lover of Marvel comics, I learned to read reading Amazing Spider-Man. I thought, wow, this is really cool. I should take a shot at this. I used to want to be a writer. And so I wrote a book and it was terrible. And uh, I had everybody As confirm that it was terrible. Yeah. And, uh, but there was something there. And so while I was going to school to be uh, an MRI tech, I decided to uh, see if I couldn't get a job on Upwork, which is Odesk now, I think. Or maybe that's the other way around. Maybe it was, o no, no, it's, it's Odesk now. And it used to be called Upwork. And there used to be these like creative writing fiction jobs, right? And it was mostly, it was like romance stuff. And so I wrote a couple of uh, short stories and the guy's like, I, I want more, 180 bucks for 10,000 word story. Give me your next one. I'm like, oh, okay. I'll give him the next one, and then the third one, and then the sixth one, and then he wanted novellas. And my wife was like, is he is he editing these? I'm like, well, he's paying somebody to edit them. And she's like, well, then clearly he's making money off of you. And I'm kind of dense, and so I'm like, yeah, he's paying us. She's like, well, maybe we should just cut out the middleman. <laughs> and then uh <laughs> yeah i read uh yeah exactly right and then i read Lindsay broker's blog where she created a pen name didn't tell anybody about it didn't do any advertising she just released a book a week for six weeks and made something like fourteen thousand dollars in the first month off of it 
And I thought, well, if that sort of thing is possible, and clearly somebody thinks I'm a good enough writer, maybe I could do my own thing. And so starting May 2015, I sat down and I wrote a book beginning to end. Um, it was 75,000 words. And then I wrote a sequel. And then I wrote a third book. And what was really interesting is, is the first book took me six months to write. The second book took me three months to write. And the third book took me a month. And it was spread out over about a year. And so what I learned from that was... Superhero books that you published? No, no, those aren't superhero books. Those are urban fantasy books that I published under a pen name um, because the first one got purchased by Kindle Press. And You were first published, you said, in, in 2016 is when you first started, right? Yeah, so I started writing in 2015, and then in June of 2016, I submitted my first book to Kindle Scout, and they accepted it, and woohoo! And Yay, it was really cool. Around. I mean... I mean, it was very gratifying to be published by somebody, to have somebody, yeah. not my family, say, well, my family, right. they wouldn't probably say I was a good writer, but I'm, a, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm an okay writer. Uh, but to, yeah, to say you're, you're good, you're good, you're good enough, we've published you. And that was really cool. And then I didn't know what I wanted to do because I didn't want to write urban fantasy. I right. just did it because I felt like it was there was a market for it and, and I could do it really good because I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer, so why not? Right. Yeah. Who doesn't? Yeah. Well, and then, um, and then I kind of did a couple of novellas for the Kindle Worlds uh, under Lindsay Broker and Jay Allen, and they were a lot of fun. But I, my passion had always been to write military sci-fi, but I wasn't there yet. You know, I wasn't there as a writer yet, and so I was reading lots of books on writing and lots of books on craft. And then I had an idea for a story, um, which ended up being my um, arsenal. Full Metal Superhero Book One, and I wrote that over nine days, and then spent a couple of months um, making it, you know, an actual book. Uh, and that came out in June of 2016, and you know, it wasn't a smash hit. Um, I'm not going to sit up on stage ever and tell people like, "Well, I wrote a book and it sold 10,000 copies," and you know, that's how I became successful. Right. Um, you know, I sold 100 copies in the first month, 200 copies in the second month, and so on and so forth. The, the second book pre-ordered. Um, uh, a few months later for 500 copies and which was great. And yeah, I just, they've been steadily making money ever since. I don't really do any advertising. I just release books every four months. Um, well, you got a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah, a couple things that I wrote down that I want to touch on. Um, the first and most, uh, important thing that we need to touch on is Covor, Covor's, Cor Corvo? Corvo's question. Corvo's question. And he says, it's been a great conversation so far, but what is the note behind you? Oh, haha. I don't have an office. <laughs> I've got four kids, and this is one of the rooms. So my daughter decorates, let's see, her room with her drawings oh, and, nice. and all kinds of stuff. There's my, my crib for my baby. So, yeah. Uh, my, my two oldest, my three oldest are in the room playing Xbox, playing uh, Lego Batman. Oh, and nice. then my youngest is is with her mom in the other room. So, yeah, sorry, I don't have an office. No, <laughs> I wish I did. Scott and I just have basements. That's all. We yeah, have. I'm I'm literally by the furnace. So <laughs> sometimes you can hear it. If it's too distracting, I, no, oh, no, I can't take it down without ripping it. Fine. Sorry. Um, you mentioned uh, at the big um, talking about reading a whole bunch of craft book, craft books when you were looking to, to kind of expand your craft a little bit. Do you remember which ones you wrote that actually that stuck Good out question. more to you than, uh, cause as I've, I've got craft books coming out the yin yang, um, and not, none of them really actually stuck out to me as a, as a, um, this is the one you need to read. Do you, do you have one that, that stuck out to you in that way? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Let me pull it up here real quick. So I make sure I have it right. Um, it's called Writing with Emotion, Tension, and Conflict, Techniques for Crafting an Expressive and Compelling Novel by the amazing, amazing Cheryl St. John. It is probably the book that has impacted my writing the most. Uh, I've read a lot of Donald Mass's stuff, yeah. Breakout Writer. I mean, uh, I've read, um, Chris recommended an editing book. I forget what it was called, but it, it's pretty good too. But of all the things that like es ex ugh, escalated my writing up, just drove it through the roof. Um, Writing with Emotion and Tension by Cheryl St. I don't want to screw up her name. Cheryl St. John uh, was was the, the book. And it absolutely was a great craft book. She's a romance writer. And if you ever want to know how to write emotion, 
then you know clearly romance writers are the yeah. way to go yeah but she has a way of building tension in the scene with just a few words and it was just it's, it's amazing it's just absolutely amazing so yeah i read that book rewrote arsenal because i felt like i was missing the emotional oomph of characters i had these great ideas for characters but they were all flash and no substance and so I read that book, rewrote Arsenal, and it ended up being like the best thing I ever, I ever did up to that point. Cool. And um, I'm gonna buy you, it right now. You started. You say you wrote uh, urban fantasy under under a pen name, and then you moved on to to the superhero genre because your love of Marvel, your love of comics. Um, superhero, the the genre, the superhero genre is kind of a growing uh, genre in 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 my opinion, in recent history over the last couple of years um, as a novel form. I don't know that I've seen it as a, a adult novel genre. Uh, it's mostly mostly um, contained to like young adult uh, and middle grade uh, fiction. Um, what do you see as, as um, obviously you have 12 books in the, in the, the genre. What do you see as kind of the, the biggest thing that's pushing that, um, those, those, this genre into, into kind of the more mainstream? Well, I mean, you know, it really depends on your audience. Uh, knowing your audience is really a big key in this business, right? If you don't know who you're writing for, then you don't really know what to write. You can write for yourself and hope your audience finds you. Um, I loved the Marvel comics of the seventies, eighties and, and the nineties before they went bankrupt. Um, you know, the, the classic X-Men stories about going into space and the Phoenix saga, um, the Avengers fighting, um, well, Thanos for one, uh, you know, Spider-Man fighting Kraven and Venom and all that stuff. I love those comics. Those are the comics I grew up on. And then when I read Wearing the Cape, I was like, oh, this is great. And I went to go look for more stuff like Wearing the Cape, and there was none. Um, for whatever reason, when people write books, they jump to the most adult thing possible. And I'm not really super interested in, in reading a bunch of, you know, people's fantasies about superheroes yeah. i was more the you know, superhero books <laughs> i like you know, oh i was wondering where you were going with that first yeah no, there, there's, oh, there's a big hair okay. Okay. Hey, listen justin is a great guy I, actually, I really like justin sloan he's a terrific guy and his books are very successful so i'm not going to say anything bad about about the harem books or it's just not my cup of tea you know what i mean oh yeah, I'm yeah. Not saying they're bad i'm just saying it's not my it's not my thing well harem books in any category because there's ha harem books everywhere in well it's it's funny is it's like I was on the science fiction and fantasy marketing podcast a couple of years ago and we had this exact same conversation, but it was about the bear shifters. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. <laughs> the, the you know, bear chested men shape shifting into a bear. Yes. Everywhere. Yeah. Every category. So you know, the, weird like cycles. So like I get like women like romance, right? Like, okay, I get it. Like that makes sense to me. But women getting all hot and bothered over shape shifting bear porn like really throws me for a loop i'm like what is going on like, they probably feel the same way about harems like they don't understand why guys like harems yeah so um google did a thing a while back where they came up with the perfect romance novel protagonist and it was a shape-shifting pirate vampire <laughs> oh yeah i can see that chance. The ultimate, like ultimate bad boy rogue loner super powerful you know and the woman has to tame him it's a romance thing it's just i like you know, Rick's, uh, reverse harem and double reverse we should do a double reverse double harem reverse harem. harem i don't, I don't know, know how that would, that would even work, be I'm down for it. I'm down to try anything. So far from superheroes. <laughs> yeah. Let's, we're gonna do a hard reset and hook right back around. But, uh, superheroes. So when I when I first started writing and uh, after I got through my urban fantasy and I did a couple of military sci-fi, I wanted to write this big epic military sci-fi, but I just didn't feel like I was a good enough writer. And I love superheroes, and my wife's always telling me, like, if there's one person who should be writing superheroes, it's you. I mean, I talk about Spider-Man all the time. I mean, it's all over my Facebook. <laughs> I still read a lot of the comics. I'm always I see all the Marvel movies on opening night, the whole bit. I mean, I, I went to a deep. Do you play? No, video I don't games? play the video game. Okay, my I don't, I don't play video games much anymore because that takes away from my ability to write. And the last thing I need as a working author is to get sucked into another game and spend forty hours playing it. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I hear that. But uh, yeah, right, right. The best I can do is a little bit of Battlefield at night, and that's kind of mindless, and I can shoot people. Yeah. In the game. Yeah, right. <laughs> in in uh, the game. 
the um and so i was like okay i'm gonna do superheroes and there just wasn't much there when i first came on um there's kevin hardman's stuff was there um there's a couple there was a couple of things but not nearly as much as there is now which is which is pretty neat to watch it's pretty exciting to watch it grow and there's people clearly who were there before me and i just uh, i have goals and uh found myself uniquely and oddly motivated to succeed for the first time odd. in my life very odd uh, i just all of a sudden destiny called and i answered and like the tick i was on the way and <laughs> when my book started selling it just motivated me to learn how to write faster and and work harder and and um i found that releasing a book every four months was the magic formula for me and so i released arsenal and then unstoppable arsenal and then an inescapable arsenal all in six months and then the next four over the last year and then two more this year and then at the end of last year when we were at vegas say it rick say vegas baby vegas, <laughs> baby. Vegas, vegas baby he was saying that anyway, earlier in the chat uh, i had this idea for the wraith which was um and i you guys are gonna laugh because everybody does it's what if the Punisher and the Batman had a baby raised by John Wick. <laughs> it's one of the That's best ideas. Really, really There's intriguing. There's a few I, biological issues with that, but we're going to skip yeah. past that. It's metaphorical. It's metaphorical. It's metaphorical. <laughs> metaphorical. So I created right. this total DNA Punisher type chick with superpowers who has no problem killing the bad guys. There's no angst. There's no issues with it whatsoever. Uh, my last book with her, the tagline was. Uh, if you're evil, you're dead. No judge, no jury, no mercy. I like and, that. Uh, yeah, most people are, right? It's that sort of the people who get away with stuff, not getting away with stuff sort of fantasy. So, yeah, so it just worked out really well. And and as I have been writing, the superhero genre has kind of exploded. Uh, Charles C.C. Akeke came in with his uh, Pantheon saga, which is brilliant. Um, all but, the, uh, the podium publishing is or release in the first book here. Um, oh, right on. You went with podium. Sweet. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Looks like he got a, um, a ensemble reading. Uh, he's got three narrators on it. So I don't oh, know. That's if, awesome. it, I'm, that's I'm fairly certain the last time he was on the show, I think there was three main characters. So I wonder if he got an area. There are, each, there are three. Yeah. Character. That's pretty well, That's really cool. And he's a brilliant writer. I don't want to talk about him the whole show because we got to talk about me, but he's right. really, really good. Um, no way, Chuck. We're talking about Jeff. Right. He doesn't like Chuck. He's a big guy. You don't want to call him a name. He doesn't yeah, like. Yeah. Him. We're pretty. We're pretty. We're pretty tough from here. I'm That's not sure right. if we're in the same room. It would be a great idea. In my mom's <laughs> basement. I like to antagonize giants. <laughs> What's funny is, is we, I met him at 20 books, and he me and him walked around the show, and it was just like I'm six four, and he's six five. So it's like. It was great. I was not the center of attention because of my height. Nobody even said, "Oh, you're tall," which is what Elbert always says. I, I could, there. I, yeah, I could, I could, I could see him being so polite about about all the comments about how tall he was because every person I ran into that hadn't been part of the conversation yet went there every time. So it's yeah, it's 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 funny. The um, so yeah, so but the biggest difference between mine and most of people's there is is that I love that feeling of the comics when you're a kid. You know that that when you read Spider-Man, you didn't think about the troubles of the world or the, Oh, everybody's evil or whatever. You're just like, is Pete going to make it? Is he going to give up or is he going to persevere? You know, is he going to lift that building off of his back? One of the best parts of Spider-Man homecoming was at the end where he was underneath that rubble. And he's like, come on, Spider-Man. I just, Oh, as a, as a kid who grew up reading Spider-Man, who saw him as an idol. I mean, I was in theater in tears when that scene happened. So to me, that's what comics are for. They give you hope, they inspire. And so I, you know, I keep the swearing to a minimum. I don't have any explicit stuff, but there's lots of sacrifice and lots of uh, suffering and, you know, and lots of, of courage and perseverance. I want to kind of talk about the, uh, the world and, and your characters and kind of uh, learn a little bit about the metal verse. Um, first uh, I want to, uh, run our show sponsor uh ad real briefly and then we'll we'll dive into that uh this week's the uh sponsor is immortals by josh joshua smith it's an epic fantasy adventure essencers of elathia i think elathia elathia fantasy names yeah what are you gonna do at least it doesn't have a comma or an apostrophe in it 
I'm gonna. That's what I'm gonna do when I write my fantasy books. I'm just gonna have an apostrophe in every single name. Uh, the world has been destroyed and remolded in the image of its destroyer. For thousands of years, stories have been told of the terrible sorceress who had given all her power to end the ancient world. But those were just stories. Now, new stars dot the sky. Signs of sorceress Jacina's power returning, so she can finish the job. For a uh, apostrophe banana no bana a bana yes with an apostrophe these signs mark the end of her service to the sorceress as priestess commanded to sacrifice a living being to injasana's name she can't go through with it abana flees into the jungle but the wide world is much different than she knows further she's being hunted by josana's sadistic son and her monstrous creations Nature, nature itself is seems to be set against her. Betel and Rant, Betel and Rant, two of the magical affairs commissions, elite agents, and powerful essencers might be her only hope. They've dedicated their lives to holding back the tide of Josanna's darkness and preventing her inevitable return. But when they discover Abana's on the edge of death, all missions are postponed in an effort to protect her. Might this strange defecting princess hold the keys to defeating the sorceress once and for all, or will she cause the two most powerful remaining essencers to meet oh to meet their doom for nothing? That's perfect. I know. Experience the start of this fantasy epic filled with magic, war, and characters that leap off the pages. It's perfect for fans of Jeff Wheeler, Brandon Sanderson, and AC Cobol. That is Immortals, an epic fantasy adventure by Joshua Smith. I'm, I don't know if I'm excited or disappointed that I couldn't put Of Doom. As I, as I have to say, uh, the most powerful remaining essencers meet their doom for nothing. Of Doom. That's how I would have had to say it. Because normally you have to add it. This is the first one we've had for a long time that had Doom in the actual description. Doom in the actual description. So, yeah. That's legit. That's legit. Yeah. And then, all, of course, all the live chatters know what they're supposed to do. Of Doom. That's right. That's right. Good when job. you write your fantasy, make sure, Josh, that you put all the proper names in the blurb. That's really important. Oh, it's very, yeah. It's, it's so important. It's so important. Because it's important that we know who all those characters are <laughs> in the blurb. Because yeah. we care at this point. When That's we right. Just stumble across a blurb, it's like, oh, wow, I'm immediately connected to all these I, random I names. Know what that I can't to pronounce. Justina. Yes. What I like is when you meet somebody and you start talking about books you like love from your childhood or fantasy books, and, and you are, you're all saying the characters differently all the names are all pronounced completely differently even Driz Driz Durden is the one that I get the most with people yeah. who not knowing how to pronounce it yep oh say, say it again because I've never known how to pronounce that name so I only know because I met him I met Ari Salvatore at a um, Borders Books and Music in Seattle way back in the day and that was like the number one question everybody asked him how do you say the name it's Driz Durden the T is silent Driz Durden See, yeah. I always thought it was R.A. Salvatore. Not R. <laughs> so I don't even know how to say the author's name. We're so yeah. bad. Is, or, he is, besides all the great authors I met at Vegas last year, he was the only author up to that point that I had ever met, and he was pretty cool. Very nice. Very prolific as well for a traditionally published. He writes 4,000 words before breakfast. Gosh, that's insane. Let's get up early. Uh, let's uh, let's go back and talk about the uh, the metaverse, which is what your fans have uh, deemed the universe. If I understood you correctly at the beginning of the yeah, show, the full metaverse, yeah, um, the full metaverse. So you have the wraith, which it, this is your your most recent series, right? That you've started as the wraith, the superhero by night series, and then you also have um, full metal superhero, and there's a there's eight book series in that. Um, so let's talk about, uh, the character, the Wraith that you mentioned, um, and then talk about the world that it's set in. The thing I like and I find interesting about superhero fiction is it, it kind of mirrors, um, the essence of like a fantasy setting, um, because that usually, I mean, it has superhero powers, but for a lack of a better word, it's magic, right? So you have some kind of system that sets up on the base of the world to explain different things. Um, well, the main character of the Arsenal would disagree with you about the magic. Her name oh. is Amelia Lockhart, and she's a scientist. And uh, ah. she, she uh, meets so-called mages, as she says it, so-called mages. And it's like, no, no, superpowers just like everybody else. I've got a really kind of cool system. 
for why superpowers work. The, the whole thing about Marvel and DC is they never have to stop and explain to you why there are superpowers. Right. Nobody stops and explains to you why Batman can do what he can do, even though he doesn't have superpowers. I mean, mm -hmm. he does things that no human can do. Or why Spidey has superpowers and he didn't die of cancer. So I wanted to do something similar to that. Um, so what I did was is, is the event that caused superpowers happened in 1903, long before any of these characters are born. So the <laughs> series are both set in modern days. Um, the, the, the year is basically the year I write the book. So the first book comes out. It's 2017 in the world. It's the real world. It's just alternate history. Um, and superpowers in the books, and this is kind of a spoiler, so it's not a huge spoiler, but basically superpowers are just the physics of another dimension attached to a human being. So if there was a I dimension like that had heavy gravity, then you're going to have someone who can lift a lot of weight. If there's a dimension that's all fire, then you're going to have, you know, flame on. Right. You know, so, um, and uh, that way it's all physics. It's just physics of a different dimension. Because I didn't want to do it. I, I wanted a, a semi-plausible explanation for what it. What if you had a dimension where people magic. change into bears? <laughs> <laughs> they have, um, actually have um, uh, uh, people with superpowers called beast mode. And what it is is they, they, are, they take on the aspects of different animals. And if they're lucky, they take on the aspect of a bear. But I think I have a guy, a villain, who's like a fly wolf ant. <laughs> it's uh, like, nice. and it's there's no shifting back it's it's you're there whatever it is that you become when the powers inhabit you and you are um and so there's people who are elementals so there's this one where the characters is an ice elemental she's pure ice her human body is gone she's just living ice and so um awesome. it's there's a it, it sort of but she can't go anywhere cold because then she'll freeze solid well, I mean, the, the, the whole the whole concept of how the superpowers oh, work in the universe is, is very brilliant, I'm have to say. I'm not usually well, that impressed, but that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, a lot I, of I'm, possibilities. I'm, I'm science-based myself. I mean, I, I consider it science fiction. Um, the race is a little more fantasy just because of the supernatural elements of it, but I, I like there to be a plausible scientific reason for it. There's nothing more frustrating than reading or watching something and then having – the lack of science just sort of slap you in the face and you're just like, that's not how water works at all. You know, that kind of thing. Right. So, um, so yeah, so that's sort of the basis of the world. And then Amelia, the main engineer, the, the main character for Arsenal, she's an engineer. She's a, a computer scientist, a metallurgist. She's a super genius. She's, she's Tony Stark really, but she's Tony Stark. If he wasn't an abusive, alcoholic, misogynistic a hole, <laughs> um, so she's a uh, she's confined to a wheelchair because when she was six years old, she was in a car accident and her parents were stolen, and they left her for dead. And so the whole book series, in the beginning, anyways, is about her building the super suit uh, along with the help of an AI that she created to infiltrate the superhero community and find out who took her parents and get them back. And then the Wraith is is about as different from Amelia as possible. And I know you asked it for me to talk about Wraith, but without explaining Arsenal, it's kind of hard. No, to no, go for it. Yeah. How the difference is. When I came up with the idea for a second book where I thought, okay, I need a second novel. I need a second series to really bring home the fans. You know what I mean? Like people might like you for one series, but if they start reading two of your series, they're, you got them, you know, yeah. and, and that's what I wanted. I'm not trying to trick them or anything. I just, you know, I, 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 I want them invested in me as the author, which right. is a whole yeah. other scary ball you of wax. You want to show them what you can do and that you, you're not a one-trick pony. You yeah, get, exactly. You multiple series. So creating a second series in the same world, the last thing I could do was create a science-based hero. You know, I couldn't create somebody who was a scientist. And so I was like, okay, well, who is the least likely person in the world to be the Punisher? And I thought, okay, well, a model. A model is the least likely person in the world to be the Punisher. <laughs> and so. Um, Having a military background, it's really hard for me to make write characters who who don't know what they're doing when it comes to guns and mm. tactics and stuff like that. And so I had to like put myself in the mindset of someone who is competent at what they do, but they're what they do is not what I do. And so yeah, so that's the that's uh, Madison Dumas is her name, and uh, she. Uh, comes home one day from her modeling gig on Thanksgiving and her entire family is murdered um, along with her little sister who she adores. And that sets her off on a path to 
justice, as she would say, not revenge. And along the way, she meets a, an ex-army ranger who trains her to get the justice that she wants and ends up being inhabited by a creature called the Wraith, who is a supernatural demon slash vampire who feeds every time she kills somebody. Kind of like Stormbringer. Stormbringer. You don't know Stormbringer. Yeah, never mind. Different series. Elric. Uh, Elric and Melody. Elric has a, yes. Okay. No. Yeah, it, he has, he has like a sword years. that eats souls. And yeah. Makes him stronger. Kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. So this creature, who she calls Spice, because the creature looks like her little sister, um, feeds on the her, the death that she causes and then grants her powers based on that. So she can teleport from shadow to shadow. So if she's in a shadow, she can teleport to another shadow. Uh, she can see in the dark. She's uh, super strong and fast. She regenerates like Wolverine. Um, and she shoots a lot of guns and swings a lot of swords. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, it's really the best combination you can have is shooting a lot of guns and swinging swords. Um, tell us a little bit about the 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 growing world because I mean, you have two series now. I'm I'm sure you're not going to stop with that. Um, do these is this? You, you've mentioned Marvel a couple times. Do you have these series set up as kind of like a, an MCU type area where some of the heroes and characters are going to kind of join together and do different things? Have they already done that? And are it's you funny to- that you should mention that. Uh, yeah. Wraith 4, which is called Danger Close, just came out uh, August 31st, and that is my first crossover <laughs> with both Wraith and Arsenal in it. Oh, awesome. Um, and it's it's my best reviewed book. I got 21 reviews in the first week. Wow. Um, it's it's uh, all five and four star reviews. Uh, everybody loves it. Um, it's it's turned out really, really well. I'm, I couldn't be more pleased with the reception for that book. And it was a super challenge to write because I wanted to avoid all the stupid cliches of, of heroes meeting that usually come along with it. Like they fight for no reason or they never seem to have an intelligent conversation, you know, where they explain each other's motives. One of my favorite parts of Civil War is where, where Cap tells Tony straight up, I'm doing this because there's a killer out there and he's going to get more killers. And Tony's like, well, I don't care. <laughs> and I was like, is, because Cap said that, though, you're like, okay, well, Cap, I'm on board with you now. And I just, I needed that sort of thing in the book instead of them fighting over a misunderstanding. And so, and that makes it once they get together and they're friends, so to speak, uh, all the better. So it's a really great book. Everybody seems to really like it. And it's it's selling pretty good. And I said it's well-reviewed. And it was a lot of fun to write two characters who could not be different. Uh, there's just no way for, one is a, you know, as Wraith would call her, a goody two-shoes um, superhero who doesn't understand how the world works. And then the other one, is Amelia would call her, is a cold-blooded psychopath. <laughs> Psycho! Uh, Rick Partlow in the chat is, one, is interested in to know if you do uh, ARCs, advanced reader copies. I do not. Um, I don't do ARCs. I don't do beta groups. I don't, I don't, I don't show my work to anybody uh, other than I have a Patreon. And so if you... If you are interested in, in, in getting the work early for $5 a month, I post my work uh, every five or 6,000 words up on Patreon unedited for the people who are really hardcore and they're like, they want to know now. Like I said, I end in every single, uh, virtually every single book ends in a cliffhanger or cliffhanger like ending. And so I get a lot of people who are like, they want to know what is going to happen and they don't want to wait the two months or three months to find out. So they shell out the five bucks a month to, uh, to get it early. Super Very fans. Nice. Yeah, super uh, fans. The, my, my best fans, you know, all three of them. That's sweet. <laughs> and one of them is your mom. Uh, so, Jeff, part of today would like to know, uh, Jeff, would you consider doing a superhero crossover story with other superhero authors in the future? I Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, Michael Cooper and a bunch of other people did that that bar crossover book. Did you oh, see yeah. that? Uh-huh. Were there in a bar? Sam's yeah. bar, Mike's yeah. bar, something like that. Bob's bar. Bob's bar. Here we go. And I thought that was genius. And uh, Michael said they didn't make any money off of it. And if they don't make any money off it, then nobody's going to make any money off of that sort of thing. But I would definitely do it for fun. I've uh, talked a little bit to Kevin Hardman about it. Um, Charles is down with the idea. I've talked to Justin a little bit about it. Um, and uh, there was one other author I spoke to. Um, Oh, and uh, Dave Barrick of Girl Power. I don't know if you read the web comic Girl Power. It's really cool, somewhat adult comic, so not safe for work for sure, but it's a fun superhero <laughs> comic. Um, he, he would be interested. And then uh, I'm going to go see Marion G. Harmon in, in November when we have 20, uh, Vegas 
because he lives in Las Vegas, and I'm gonna I'm pitch the idea at him and see if he's because if I can get him on board, that would be the, the he's the gold standard. So, very cool. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about your your process. Um, uh, I mean, you mentioned you're doing a book every four months, um, and I'm I'm assuming that's um, publish and then start writing the next book and then publish and start writing the next book. So, so how does the, how does the process work for you on a, on a daily basis? And then, um, throughout your, your overall process, do you, do you look at, you know, six months out, a year out and, and plan that stuff ahead and then write to hit those goals? What does it look like for you? I don't know this word plan. Yeah. <laughs> plan? No. So, uh, there's a lot of people that call that heresy. Uh, I, I wish I could. I really do. I wish I could sit down and plan out a storyline eight months in advance, and that's just not me. So what I do is I sit down and I start writing, and I figure everything out as I go along. And I have general ideas about how I want books to go. I, I, mostly I write books based on how I want people to feel at the end of the book. Mm. So do I want them to cry? Do I want them to be happy? Do I want them to jump up and down and go, yeah, you know? Um and, and usually I'm pretty good at hitting that. Uh, but that's pretty much the only thing I kind of stick with is what do I want people to feel while they're reading the book and how do I want them to feel when they're done? As for specific ideas and elements, it's really hard for me because while you're writing, you come up with better stuff than you ever could while you're not writing. Mm. And so my process is, and bear in mind, I spent the last three years kind of perfecting this and working toward this. So this is not something I did three years ago. This is just, this is where I am now is I get up at six 30. I take my daughter to seminary. When we get home, I go to Chick-fil-A and I write for four hours and I usually write between four and 5,000 words in that time. You write and, at Chick-fil-A? Yeah. It's, awesome. They come to your table and they refill your drink and, and they super say nice. my pleasure. And they say my pleasure. And, yeah. the, and occasionally when I do eat occasionally, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I love chick-fil-a man They're the great. food is really good yeah so um uh, it's like i always in my last book i actually dedicated to them because it's like i'm writing at home except somebody comes and fills my drink up so i drink about seven gallons of dr pepper while i'm there and um <laughs> yeah and i do that five six days a week and uh, you know I usually i wrote this last book i actually wrote it in 14 days and for danger close and that was my record and I'm really happy with it. And so this book, the one I'm working on now, which is full metal superhero nine, I don't have a title for it yet. I'm still working on it after eight books. I've used a lot of really cool titles. Uh, and so now I'm like I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel. You should have Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Just call it uh, Arsenal nine. Is yeah. Of, Arsenal nine. Yeah. But uh, my Play last one was Arsenal reloaded. So I'm like, how do I top that? You know, it's so good. Well, what's the third matrix movie? Um, Revel Arsenal Revelations. There you go. You no, go right after, right after no, right. Reloaded. You go Arsenal Revelations. But then uh, it would be bad. All the black <laughs> album. That's right. They could they could be fighting in the rain with a whole bunch of green lightning going off. It'd be fantastic. It's super I, cool I do movie. have a Superman s kind of guy, but he's Greek themed, not not alien themed. But uh, um, you see, you mentioned earlier in the show you wrote a book in nine days, and now uh, you just mentioned writing one in fourteen days. Okay, so the difference is the nine day book I ended up rewriting a couple of times. Okay. Right? But I mean, the, the bones of it, I wrote in nine days. It was a complete story. It just wasn't a good complete story. Right. Um, what you, what, if you go and buy a Wraith Danger Close today, you will read what I wrote in those 14 days. The only thing that was done to it after I wrote it was uh, my awesome editor, Scott Walker. He ran through it and, you know, made sure that I didn't miss any, you know, uh, stupid timeline stuff. Right. You know, like, oh, you said this here, and then you did this, and which I'm famous for. Like, and then yeah, he, somebody loses a hand, but then they have a hand again later. Yeah, right. Stuff I like did that. that one. <laughs> Scott did that as well. I, did and, that. Um, I had to go fix it. Well, I mean, like, people's hands do get chopped off in this book. So, uh, yeah. and also, I mean, I don't really do developmental editing. I'm kind of like, this is my story. Mm. You, know, you like it or you don't. I'm, I'm not really into other people's opinion on my stories. But Scott and I work really well together. He found me at a convention last year, and we just we work really well together. And he had one suggestion, which is tie up the relationship of the story uh, of the protagonist and her somewhat new boyfriend at the end of the book, which I thought was a great plan. But other than that, I mean, what you read is what I wrote, and uh, other than the typo fixing and stuff like that. So, nice. so that nine-day book ended up – I mean, I wrote it, 
but then I went back and added stuff and rewrote a few things and added a few more things. This book, no, 14 days. We've got a couple suggestions for the title of your ninth book. Uh, um, Rick Partlow sure. says uh, Arsenal Football should be the, the name. And then uh, Baird of Today says Arsenal Filet. And then uh, Rick Partlow also put uh, Arsenal of Freedom. Ooh, uh, I like that one. Taken. That's, uh, Rick, taken. I might use that one. Um, I'm curious uh, about the to expand a little bit on your process. Sure. Uh, the 14 days to write the draft, but then you do every four months for the publishing. So is it 14 days to write it and then you take that time to tweak it and edit it over the four months? Or what's the what's the longer time frame then for the between the books? Well, so, I mean, if you look at it, I wrote, I released the book in March and then I released the book in June and then I released the book in August. So it's really, it's every two, two and a half months, Okay. but every, every series is four months. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's four months between a book series. So between Arsenal eight and Arsenal okay. nine, it'll be four months between Wraith three and Wraith four. It was four months, that kind of thing. So okay. every two months you're hopping it. back and forth. Then. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, usually what it is, the delay though, is, is I get sick. <laughs> got a terrible immune system and I'll get a flu. I had two flus this year. Who gets two flus in a year? <laughs> I feel robbed by the CDC because I got the flu shot and I got both the flus that they missed. And I just, and then right before we went on vacation, I got super bad cold. It's just, it's not fair, but uh, I'll get sick or when my kids will get drink, sick. Drink more coffee. That probably. <laughs> well, I, I'm oh, Mormon, so there's no coffee, no alcohol. Oh, so right. yeah. none of that. But uh, I do drink um, like these vitamin C uh, things called uh, Odwalas, which are really great. They're out of Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, they usually cut my sickness down. But I'm 46 now. And so it's like when I get sick, it's not for like a day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's you like three weeks really later. Man. So uh, other than that, though, stuff happens. You know, life happens. Life is always happening all around us. And we had a baby in May. So, um, you know, there's always something. I always plan to jump right into the next book. But, you know, I'll get sick or, you know, and sometimes I deal with some depression issues that, 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 you know, swing up on me from related to my time in the army and some other stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so life happens. It just right. it does. But my fans are great. And I try to keep them informed about where I'm at in the process. I get excited about stuff. And so sometimes I'll jump the gun and say, I'm going to do something. And then I start doing it and realize it doesn't work. Like I still get asked about the superhero I announced at the beginning of the year that I shouldn't have. <laughs> Scott and um, I don't know anything about announcing yeah. something we get excited about and then backtracking on that. Right. Uh, well, and then, actually, Jay, and Jay a, Olivia, by the way, Jay Oliviera says uh, Arsenal, the ultimate sacrifice is a good book for. Uh, well, that's definitely the right theme because boy, does that girl sacrifice. But unfortunately, that's too long. My cover designer would freak out. She'd be like, no, then there's only going to be the title on the book. You know, Just cut it off at one side, and then like you have to make people guess what the title is. Ooh, like, Ultimate Arsenal, though. That could be cool. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. I like that. Uh, Jay has, uh, has a question in the chat. He says, uh, how tough is it to come up with original superpowers when we already have a, a plethora of heroes around? I'll tell you, nothing is more enjoyable to me as an author than when someone says, this is just like Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> and by that i mean it's not enjoyable at all right <laughs> uh poor poor uh what's uh, shane silver you go over on his facebook stuff and all you see is oh so it's like constantine then i'm like yeah except for it's nothing like constantine you know right. what i mean right yeah so people like to boil stuff down to like the tiniest you know the to the largest possible amount so oh she has armor she must be iron man mm-hmm. you know luckily for the wraith nobody could, compares her to other people um, because she's not easily comparable. So she is more original, so to speak, than um, than Iron Man. But she really is just Batman, Punisher, and John Wick all rolled into one. Um, the So to answer your question, whoever it was that asked. Jay. Jay. Sorry. Um, really hard. <laughs> because every time I come up with a superpower, I'm like, okay, what famous Marvel Comics character has the superpower and how can I make it different enough that the first thing I see on a review won't be, well, this is just like so-and-so. And And the reviewers mean it in a good way, so it's not like I shouldn't take it as an insult. It's just frustrating to me when that's like the first thing they say. But that's just how people are. It's just how people work. It's the psychology of it. We We want something original, but we want it to be just like the other thing that we like. And 
that's just how it is. Well, that and that's and that's your language. Your your language, your, the lexicon of superheroes is you have all this this list of superpowers, and so you're going to cross reference them and whatnot. My favorite superpowers are the Civic Minded Four from the Tick. Have you ever saw that? <laughs> And static electricity man and recycle. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love the tick. I, I'm not I'm such a fan of the new Amazon one, but that, that cartoon was just oh it was the best. The um one of the things I liked about the tick was how indestructible he was. Yeah. And there's just something fun about a character who can't be hurt. I just, I barely remember it. I, I was working at the methadone clinic right after I got out of college and working was, there, huh? And, yeah, and I was working, working there, all right. But it was always it was always it's always on in the uh, in the lobby. So you had. I'm, I'm going to be at the show tonight. <laughs> yeah, methadone, not math. Oh, oh yeah. Um, I, I'm curious about the. It's funny because I think that a lot of readers jump that direction where like this is just like this or just this is just like that because, for the most part, the readers when they jump into genres or stories are looking for like the same thing only different. So it's interesting. Right. You know, like like oh, this is just like Iron Man when they say it negatively, right? Like oh, this is just like Iron Man. Like, but that's cool. Like a lot of people like Iron Man, so they want a different take on Iron Man. Um, or this is just like Star Wars. Well, like so there's, I think if you, there's it, always something that you could compare something else to that has some simula similarities. I think when you when they when they come when they bring in two, you know, like if, if they say this is like John Wick and the Punisher, if they if that was their description, that feels more like a compliment. You know, it's like this and this. I'm really yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. And things, but and know. I think for the most part, when they say it in my reviews, it is a compliment because it'll be like, Oh, this is just like Iron Man, five stars. You know, I love Iron I'm, Man. I mean, right. yeah. I mean, ask so Josh about Iron Man. I think Josh has Iron Man tattoo or uh, should of Iron Man. I think he get it past Jamie. <laughs> she's not like Iron Man at all. <laughs> yeah. Except part. completely different. Yeah, yeah, completely yeah, different. But, it's the same thing. I mean, is that, different. If that's what brings you to the series, by all means. Yeah, she's a lot like Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure she is. Come on, in, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. Come come check it out. Stay it's with really me. Funny is in, uh, in book four, she gets this sort of uh, not nanite, she gets this um, armor that has made of liquid metal. And it's really mm -hmm. cool. And it came out about a year before or about a month before uh, Infinity War came out, and then we're sitting in Infinity War, and um, you know, the, his armor he does that great scene where he taps his chest, and yeah, it, awesome Iron yeah. Man suit up. And Rebecca's like, You know, you're gonna get a review that says you ripped that off, right? And I'm like, Yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, we had a, a pretty pretty lively episode a couple weeks ago talking about in game and the MCU, um, and the the kind of the 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 differencing uh, the difference of opinions between uh, people who absolutely loved in game and then people who were like, oh, they they screwed it up because of time travel. I'm I'm interested on in your thoughts on that. As we as we wrap up the show, what are your thoughts on the the MCU and how they did with the in game? The end game, man, coming home from end game was like coming home from a funeral. <laughs> yeah it just my kids and i and my wife were all driving home and we're dead silence in the car just dead silence and usually we're all chipper and talking about the movie and the scenes that we liked and stuff like that but not even civil war affected us that way mm. and which is a sign of a great movie in my opinion i mean endgame was a cinematic event that we will never see again in our lifetime i just i don't see how that would even rem remotely be possible i agree um uh, and it was amazing. I and there were parts of it that I loved, and there were parts of it that I didn't care for. And I didn't care for the time travel aspects of it. Um, they set up some really hard rules, and then they broke all of them. Right. So, yeah. And they hand waved it, and that was annoying. But um, I will accept that <laughs> for Avengers Assemble. Oh you know, yeah. All, I yeah. Just, all day. That, all day long. I will take whatever crap they want to give me. When Cap raises that hammer and says Avengers Assemble, Baseball. that was. Everything. That was the culmination of my life right there. I mean, I've been waiting my whole life to see him, hear him say that on screen. So, I mean, it's, it's that's you know. one of the things Josh brought up in our earlier episode is how it's used. That's used all the time in the comics, but that was the first time in, in the cinematic. Josh Whedon was very vocal about how he would never let them say that. Hmm. That was not a thing he was ever going to do. And I was mad at him for the time because I felt like he should have said it at the end of Ultron. But they didn't even do an, a cut with it, him saying it in the end of Ultron because he was worried that the studio would then put it in. Well, they, so, he almost said it like right at the end. They yeah, right. That's the scene. Yeah. 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 He cut it off. He The actor actually never said the words. Right. Because Joss Whedon didn't want them to film it and then 
use that what edit. What was problem with that? Why didn't he like that? I, I, you know, he never explained it. He just said that as long as he was with Marvel, that they would never say that. Now, having said that, I was really mad at him at the time, but then I felt like Cap earned it so much mm-hmm. by the end of Endgame that there was no more other place he could have ever said it that would have been as special. Yeah. So, and yeah. One of the crazy things I think about uh, Endgame and, and the MCU is that um, I had to uh, literally twist my wife's arm to get her to start watching the the Marvel movies with me. And like, I begged her for two weeks to watch um, Captain America with me. Cause we want, I wanted to do it in um, chronological order and not release order. So I, you know, started with Captain America mm-hmm. and worked through the rest of them. Um, and now almost every Saturday in games on the TV, um, because it's we have we own it now, and I'm like, who turned on in game? And she always blames it on my my two year old. Carter wanted to watch it. Really, yeah. Carter wanted to watch it. Yeah. Hulk. He wanted to see Smart Hulk. I mean, it's almost plausible because he loves Hulk, right? But uh, yeah, I am. I'm I'm really lucky. My wife was on board right from the beginning. We we went and saw every single movie every weekend that it came out. She loved Iron Man, and then then she just really loved Cap, and Cap was her guy. So it worked out. I, uh, I I do having said that I do have a couple of problems with the movie. I didn't like how they treated Thor. I thought they turned Thor into Gimli, and that really annoyed me. <laughs> yeah, and I thought Smart Hulk was weird, but he was different. Uh, I, I didn't dislike him, but he was he was slightly. The, I thought it was really funny um, at when they first went to New York, and uh, Cap was like, you know, go Hulk smash, and he he did this whole like like kind of half. Uh, 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 yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. That was pretty funny, um, and 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 Thor. Honestly, there were some hilarious lines from Thor. It, it wasn't that he wasn't good. It just right. I didn't like what they did with him. They, they it wasn't his character. Yeah. They they turned him into fat Thor with an alcohol problem, and yeah. I just more more. My wife won't watch it because of fat Thor. She's like, <laughs> he can't be fat Thor. Really, it wasn't that they made him fat, and it wasn't that he became a drunk. It's that he ran away from his problems. Right. And you know, in, in the last movie we saw him, what did he say? I'm a hero and I run toward my problems, right. not away from them. You know what I mean? And yeah. so I don't feel like no matter what happened after that, that character would become the character of the end game. They did that because the char- the actor, as good as he is, is bored of playing heroic Thor. And so that was sort of his deal with Marvel is I'll keep playing Thor. But if you let me be non-heroic Thor. Hey, goofball. So they traded the the awesome heroic Thor for the cheesy um, lines that he, you know, creepy lines he got to say in the movie, like, uh, of course you're in charge. Of course, uh, you know. Are we back? Yeah. Are we still back? Are we there? Uh, I'm here. Wow, Scott's that's here. Really weird. I had like a little hiccup in my internet. I was like freaking out. Like I'm like getting cold sweats right now. Like, holy crap, what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> Is it time travel in the MCU? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They yeah. With it. Oh, man, that's crazy. Disney yeah. just cut your internet out. Yeah, that was like, oh, we're, we're sorry, Disney. Sorry. Um, but, um, yeah. I but, yeah so that's, but mostly I love the movie, so don't get me wrong. Mostly I'm interested to see movie. what they do with uh, As Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, because, like, like I, I, and we talked about this in the other episode, is, is, um, uh, I didn't like the first two Thor movies. Um, and then originally did not like Ragnarok because it wasn't like the other two Thor movies. But now when you go back and watch Ragnarok, I really like Ragnarok now because it really feels like the rest of the MCU. But there's some problems with the movie. I mean, I could, I could spend hours telling you things I like and didn't like about the movie. One thing is, is I wish they would. I love humor in movies, but humor cuts tension. Mm-hmm. I and mean, that's what it's for. It's why you don't have a lot of horror comedies, is because it's hard. Horror is about building tension, <laughs> right? Comedy is about cutting right. tension, right? Yeah. And so every time there was a moment where the tension could have been awesome in Thor, they played a joke. Yes. And yeah, and it kind of it removed the emotional punch that the movie should have had. Yeah. Um, not having said that, it was still really enjoyable. Ragnarok was still really enjoyable. Yeah. I just feel like people get a little like, oh, this will be really funny, and sometimes it's great to play for the laugh, and sometimes you need to let the tension ride. That that was my original, uh, not hate about it, but my, my original dislike is is the same thing. Every time they had an, an emotional, impactful scene, it was immediately ended with a one line quip, 
and which removed the impact for and for every scene it wasn't just yeah. like did it every like every single know. one yeah like the scene where he's like i run toward my pro- i choose to run toward my problems is immediately ruined by him getting hit in the head with his ball right know? exactly and as a writer you kind of have the same issue because like when you're writing what you don't oops sorry what you don't you can't as a writer it's craft wise when you're having your characters feel emotions you have to be very careful with how you express those characters expressing their emotions Mm -hmm. because once the character feels those emotions the audience will not if your character on screen is sad or in the book is sad and you make it known that they're sad your audience will not be sad yeah, because you are giving them that cathartic release through the character. So sort of the same thing. If you want tension in your book when you're writing, you have to be you have to pull back a little. Because normally we're like, you know, she's angry, she's sad, whatever. Not like that, but you know what I mean. Right. But when you want your audience to feel something, you have to stop and 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 let the audience feel it. And if you take that away from them, then they don't remember the scene. It's not as good. It's 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 definitely not the way to go. Yep, I agree. Um, all right, well, we've uh, run over our time, and but that, uh, usually that always happens when we have great. Uh, episodes. You told me to talk a lot. Yes, no, no, I <laughs> we enjoy the the time. We enjoy the talk time. Uh, if if I could stand it and Scott could stand it, we'd probably do two or three hours of of talking. Because once we start talking about books and writing, we could probably go for days and days. Um, but uh, it, Jeff, it was great having you on the show, and uh, hopefully you can come back at some time. We always like to have re- repeat guests and and bring people back to talk about uh, how they've how their year has gone, uh, season to season. I think I can't remember is is uh, is Weber or Fox the hold the 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 yeah, title of most returned guest. I can't oh, remember. I think they're tied. I think they're tied. Or Edelheit's been back. A few times. I have goals no, now. Oh, yeah. You've yeah, got a rank. Weber and Fox are, are tied. I, I would really like to co- have you come back sometime and talk more about the, uh, the uh, uh, what's it called? The writing with emotion, tension, and, and conflict. Hmm. Sure. Stuff and, and go into that. That would be could be cool. That'd be a fun roundtable. I know it might be come as a shock to you two, but I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> We, we can do some talking. We should have a, a competition to see who can talk the longest. Uh, everybody that was in the live chat, thank you guys for coming and hanging out with us tonight. It was uh, very uh, eventful and uh, really just really, really good conversation in the live chat. If you're listening on the feed and you don't know that we have a live chat on Mondays and Thursday nights, come out and hang out with us on YouTube uh, every Monday night and Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central is when we broadcast, and we're always there every week. Uh, Lauren, I don't know what she has coming up this week. Maybe she can tell me in the chat as I'm signing off. Uh, next week, we'll probably have a round table, and we'll probably put a poll up in the group to see what we talk about. I'm not talking about Dune, so don't ask me about Dune. I don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk about Dune? No. Jason Momoa as Duncan Idaho? Who wants? Who doesn't want to talk about that? Jason Momoa as Duncan Idaho? That's that's what I saw on Wiki. I do want to see the uh, the yeah. remake. I, I I'm interested in seeing the remake. I always okay. imagine Duncan Idaho being an older character than that. But. I thought David Lynch's Dune was exceptional, and uh, who knows what they'll do with the remake. I hated the movie that came out a couple of years ago on Sci Fi Channel. So yeah, yeah, it was gross. But most Sci Fi yeah. channels, I mean, come on. Uh, let's see. Lauren says Kevin J. Anderson is going to be on the show Thursday to talk about dictation oh, nice. tips. Speaking yeah. of Dune. Uh, speaking of Dune, yes. How That's to sweet. a dictator by Kevin J. Anderson. He's going to be on the show Thursday. About that. <laughs> that that really guy's awesome. Show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on again, brother. It's been a blast. And uh, everybody else, we will see you next week. We are going to talk about some writing. We're going to talk about some reading. And of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. See you. I hate that it takes forever to turn on.